Second Sunday of Advent. As you've heard, we're talking about peace. Peace appears in the Bible over 300 times. When you look at peace in Webster, it talks about freedom from war and conflict. When you get to the end of the definition, it says serenity, calm, quiet, tranquility. And if you look in the Greek, it comes from a word meaning quietness, rest. Many of us have different thoughts about peace. Some of us think about a, a child that is sleeping and very calm. We might think about a, a brook passing by or a sunset or sitting by the ocean watching the water just come in. Well, in Philippians 4, Paul speaks about peace. Beginning in verse 6, I want to share with you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now Paul in this letter is addressing a troubled church. He's saying there shouldn't only be peace with others within the church, peace amongst the people, there has to be peace within the individuals. An inward peace. Each one should have peace. A peace that passes understanding. To be troubled, to be worrisome, to be fearful or to fret means we don't trust God's wisdom. That we don't trust his faithfulness and his goodness. You remember how Paul started this section? He says, do not be anxious about anything. We shouldn't worry. We shouldn't have anxiety. But you know, as you hear things about this country, we run on a very high level of anxiety. But Paul says we shouldn't have that if we have his peace. And he says, what can we change by worrying? Not a thing. We can't change anything by worrying about it. You can worry yourself sick and nothing changes. And Jesus addressed this in Luke 12. He says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? So what he's saying is worry and fear and anxiety don't change anything. Nothing positive comes from worry, and worry can be destructive. Physically and spiritually, worry can destroy you. You say, well, why would that destroy me? Because if you're worrying and your mind is not on Christ and not focused on the Lord, then you've lost sight of the Lord. And we lose sight of God's goodness and His faithfulness and His blessings. And then we start becoming negative and we start becoming ungrateful. And all of a sudden we're, we're turning away from God. And Paul says in verse 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace is a healing balm for your lives. When we rest in his peace... It's just a healing balm. It's just something there that just makes a difference. God's peace is like the guard standing at the door. A guard is there to keep you safe, to keep out the, the intruders. They're there to protect you. 
Well, peace doesn't allow worry and fear to enter into your life. When you have that peace, and when you allow that peace to be your shield, it, it keeps the worry and the conflict and things out of your life. There was a time in my life when I didn't have that peace. There was a time in my life when I was in the ministry, when I was at Jewel, I was going to school in Kansas City, and, and one day I was going down 70, so on Sunday afternoon, going back to school, there's cones in the middle of the interstate. You just got one lane of traffic, and my pickup quit. And there was a lot of anxiety, and there's a lot of worry. Because when I pulled off this, I just went down in the median and sat there for a while, and, and people were just going just back and forth by you. Nobody's stopping. But that's all changed. The other night when I ran over the deer out by Cullison, there was absolutely none. I ran over him, pulled off to the side of the road, shut the car off, got out and saw that the radiator was damaged. People stopped, said, are you all right? I said, I'm fine, go on. One young man said, I'll stay here with you. I just called the sheriff's office and said, I had a deer hit and I need a wrecker. There was no anxiety. There was no worry about how is this going to be taken care of. It was just peace. And that's what Christ wants us to have in everything. That peace that passes understanding. Now there's people that won't understand when you have peace in the midst of turmoil. When you have peace in the midst of struggles. They, 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 they kind of don't understand. Some of them don't even think it's rational to have peace when there's trouble around. Paul says, the peace of God surpasses all comprehension. He knew that people weren't going to be able to understand it. But it, it surpasses under, comprehension. And in John 14 he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. See, some people try to find peace in the world. The world cannot give you peace. It can only give you turmoil. Peace comes from God. So let's look at four keys to receiving this peace. In, in verse 6, Paul says, By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So, prayer is one of the first things that we have to have. Whatever is bothering you, whatever is keeping you from peace, needs to be brought before God. Don't be bashful. If it's a concern of yours, it's a concern for God. Take it to Him. And leave it with Him. Because He wants us to have peace. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So first, we need to go to God in prayer. We need to be taking it to him in prayer. And as I was thinking about this this week, I thought, every week something has taken me back to prayer. We've been talking about prayer. We went through Circle Maker, and every week I keep going back there. Something about prayer that we need to be listening, and we need to be talking to God, taking it to God. The second thing we need to do is thanksgiving. In the middle of verse 6, it says, With thanksgiving. So often we get caught up in worry and fear, we forget to count our blessings. Christy, our daughter-in-law, she's had a lot of health issues, a lot of things in her life. And she will call and she'll be talking to Mary and she'll be going on about what's happening and how bad things are. And, and I'll hear Mary say, but remember. Remember what God's done. Remember the positives. Remember those things. We're, we're so easy for us to get on the negative. And forget the positive. 
Think about where he's brought you so far. Thank him for his faithfulness. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trust in him and he helps me. From Psalms. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. From Psalms 28. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 118. Give thanks. Give thanks. So we need to give, we need to pray. We need to be in prayer. And we need to, to give thanks. And then we need to dwell on the positive. There are people in life that one speaker I heard one time called them joy suckers. They just take all of the joy out of your life. You see them and you know that they're just going to start sucking all the joy out. But then there's those that are so positive when you talk to them. They're so positive that some people can't stand them because they're so positive. You know, I, every time we go over to Pratt and we go by Parkwood now and see Helen Swarm, she's 98 years old, I think, and she is one of the most positive people. There was times when there was somebody we went to see, we went to see them before we went to see Helen so we could be lifted back up. Because the joy suckers had done taking it out of us and we had to go see Helen. That's just the way some people are. But she is so positive. We need to be positive. I Me mean, to be like this young man, there was a... a man walking by a baseball game on the street one day he saw some kids playing and he went up to talk to one of the young men that was on the team and he said who's winning and he said oh they are he said they are yeah it's 10 to nothing and he said well that's really got to discourage you doesn't it and the young man said no it doesn't discourage me we haven't even batted yet <laughs> he was positive he was positive we need to be like that. We need to be like him. So we need to pray. We need to give thanksgiving. And we need to be positive. And then we need to be obedient to God's word. Verse 9 says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Put it into practice. Whatever we get from him. And he, the God of peace, will be with us. So there's three ways that obedience leads to peace. If we obey God's word, we avoid pitfalls. See, if we're living by the word of God, we're not going to fall in those holes that destroy us. In those pitfalls. Great peace have those who love their law. And nothing can make them stumble. Psalm 119. And Proverbs 3, 1 and 2 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. When we're doing all we can to please God, we will have peace. And in Acts 24, 16 says, So I strive always to keep my conscience clear, before God and man. So with a clear conscience. With obedience we have a clear conscience. And a clean conscience. Which in turn promotes peace. In us. And lastly look beyond self. And serve others. Jesus said I did not come to serve. But to, to be served. But to serve. And Galatians 2 says. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So we need to be in prayer. We need to give thanksgiving. We need to be positive, And we need to be obedient to God's word. Now as I read this scripture. And as I was thinking about the service. I read the scripture that uh, Connie read a while ago. I thought about Mary. And I thought about. How she was doing all of these things. Before the angel came and told her she would be with child. And she said, may it be as you said. 
Do you think maybe she had peace? I think for her to be able to say, may it be as you said, when she knew that she was going to be pregnant and she was going to have to explain this to Joseph and all of the things that were going to happen, be it she said, may it be as you said. I think she was probably praying. She was giving thanks. She was being obedient. She was being positive. One of the commands that Jesus gives us is do this in remembrance of him. This morning we're going to break bread together. I pray that as we do that, that you would think about peace. God's peace. That you might take the elements that you receive and Think about the peace that Christ offers to us. And dwell upon these words. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times. And in every way, the Lord be with all of you.